Hey, hey, you like listening to Kirby Fan freak out over how great the Nintendo DS is? Great, because today I am going to be gushing about how great the Nintendo DS is. Again, we've gone over Squeak Squad and Mass Attack already, but for those who don't follow my channel, the pick between Superstar Ultra and Canvas Curse for my favorite DS game might actually be kind of a tricky pick. And don't get me wrong, I love both of these games, but for those who are familiar with the channel, you knew which game would be here as soon as I said the word Nintendo DS. And if you didn't, listen, you gotta subscribe. Help me reach my year-end goal of 600 subs. Oh, and so that the next time a question like this pops up, you're gonna have the answer. If you got it right, still sub? Anyway, I love Kirby Canvas Curse. A while ago, I said a lot of good and bad things about Rainbow Curse, and a lot of the negative things I said about that game were related to how they were better, or just non-existent, in Canvas Curse. Having talked about Rainbow Curse already, anything I said there involving gameplay, I'll try and just skim over here. But I did make an effort to avoid a lot of the stuff in that video. Now, I have a lot to say about Canvas Curse because, well, I love Canvas Curse. To start, let's actually compare it to Rainbow Curse and go over the biggest improvement compared to that game, the pacing. Kirby's speed in this game could not be better. He isn't slow, he falls at a reasonable speed, and the speed at which he moves fits the size of the screen. Also helping matters is that, when Kirby dashes through an enemy, he doesn't bounce back, he keeps moving. Which, well, let's be honest, is what just should have happened in Rainbow Curse in the first place. But this isn't Rainbow Curse, it's Canvas Curse. What makes this game so amazing standalone? While it's certainly impressive that the devs came up with all of these cool touchscreen ideas as early as 2005, I'm looking at all of these games in 2020. Why is it still good? It's because the game had all of those cool ideas in 2005, and they're still cool today. Levels may not be massive, but they're very easy and intuitive to explore. Having a map of the room you're exploring on the top screen is really helpful, especially since it shows you where metals are, given the metal is in that room. I'll go into more detail on the metals later, but for now, note down that I really like the map on the top screen. It's certainly better than the top screen in Mass Attack, given that, you know, I actually bothered to even bring it up. Canvas Curse is split into seven different worlds and a final area, with seven worlds having three levels each. You can tackle the levels in any order you want, but this isn't something like Amazing Mirror where you can tackle those worlds out of order. This makes the experience much more controlled than Amazing Mirror, given you still have the freedom to pick which levels you want to clear first. I enjoy that. The levels themselves look fantastic on the visual side of things. While it isn't as blatant as Epic Yarn and Rainbow Curse, Gambit's Curse does have a unique visual style inspired by paintings and drawings. Backgrounds range from really cool-looking paint-inspired landscapes to a more standard sprite work kind of aesthetic that still fits the game. The characters are updated versions of the GBA sprites. So listen, the 2000s really loved these, but they have some added flair and style here that make them stand out, especially Kirby. The style of the cutscene is probably what I remember the most from this game's visuals, ignoring the final boss, which I'll get into later. Regarding the cutscenes, I really wish there were more of these. There's the opening and the ending cutscene, that's kind of it. I like that the menu backgrounds and the pause menu stick to the style of these cutscenes, but I just want more of it, it looks so good. It feels a bit early to bring up the soundtrack, but while we're talking about the presentation, let's talk music because it's really good. This is one of the first Kirby games where the soundtrack is primarily remixes. They're all fantastic. It mostly pulls from Adventure and Superstar, but there's Kirby 64 and even some Dreamland 2 and 3 in here. Great stuff.
but then the original tracks play and this sets an even higher bar than the remixes do. But a big part of that is the final boss, which uh, I know I just said this, but I'll get into all of that later. Similar to Mass Attack, what Kirby can do is very simple and easy to understand. You use the touchscreen to move Kirby around and draw a path for him to follow. What helps this game's case is that it has copy abilities. It's definitely an interesting game to have them in, and while there's very few, I think they all stand out and are a lot of fun to use. That said, I legitimately find myself playing with normal Kirby most of the time, because moving around with him is just the most fun and fluent. I don't think this is an issue with the whole game, but it is a negative for the copy abilities. Whatever ability you use replaces Kirby's dash. Not the end of the world, since you can draw a circle around Kirby to make a move much quicker, but not only does tapping Kirby just feel better, I also think it's more intuitive. Touch the character, make him go faster, keep touching him, keep making him go faster, easy. In the defense of the abilities though, this makes them very unique for a Kirby game. Usually I just use any random ability I feel like using until I'm ready to move to the next one, but here I start the same, find an ability I want and go from there, but when I'm done with it, I can go back to using normal Kirby and still keep the pace of the game moving consistently. The ability standing out less works well for the game in a way, kind of like how Dreamland 1 does. And it's not even like I don't love some of these abilities. Burning, I shouldn't really have to explain, me loving speedrunning and all. But there's Balloon, which is crazy inventive and weird, a total blast to control. Abilities like Ice and Needle keep the speed going, which is nice. And while the noise can get loud, Beam is fun to just blast things away with. And for the underwater levels, you'll never see me without stone, because underwater levels with stone are super cool and fun to move through. I think Tornado goes a little too slowly for my taste, but otherwise, the abilities here are really good. A lot of praise I've been giving to Canvas Curse revolves around the movement, and while it's among the best parts of the game, there are other high points here too. The side content, for example, will keep you hooked for hours. Rainbow Curse certainly has the game beaten how many different things there are, but Canvas Curse somehow still beats it out, not only in variety, but also in the amount of things that have to get done. As you play through the main game, you can collect medals, which you can trade for rewards at the metal shop. Some of these are kinda useless, like different brush colors, but most of them are really cool rewards, like increased health, tracks for the sound test, and even other playable characters, who you have to fully go through every level with to get 100%. Come on, that's just padding. Day to day especially is bad since his only perk, more health, is negated by the extra health Kirby gets from the shop. On the bright side, actually getting the medals is a simple and enjoyable process. If you have a keen eye for finding secrets, you'll be able to get them without an issue, but the act of actually getting them is a total blast. Part of that is because the levels are fun to explore and move around in, but also because they're simply placed in well thought out areas. Some are a bit odd, like having to hit some switches in a different level to get them, but most of them either require exploration and use of the top screen's map to find, or precision and maybe even some copy abilities to nab. Great stuff. Where the real meat of the side content lies, and the best part of it, is in the challenge stages. These are almost similar to the challenge stages in Return to Dreamland, but instead of focusing on using an ability quickly and efficiently, these challenge you in one of two ways either clear an area really quickly, or clear an area using minimal ink. These are such a blast to go through, especially for someone like me who geeks out over games requiring the player to use optimization. Going fast is par for the course with speedrunning and all, but clearing these challenges using as little ink as possible is something you can only do in Canvas Curse. You even get medals as a reward for doing good, so it's not like you're doing this just for 100%. The bonus game at the end of every level even has its own mode too, which, I don't know, I mean cool. But what I'm saying here is that the side content in this game is remarkable. I genuinely like Rainbow Curse, so I don't want to bash it too hard, but how a game in 2005 has more meaningful content than the 2015 sequel, even though that one has more content, simply just baffles me. And let's talk about the world of Drossia. <laughs> This is a dark, eerie, lifeless area with seemingly no music to fill the void. Then you hear it and, it, and it's just the noise. When the main melody starts, that noise doesn't go away. The seemingly random assortment of colors that fills the entire screen, except for Kirby, who stands out as the only thing you can see that has any kind of life to it. 
just adds to the atmosphere. There hasn't been anything like this in a Kirby game yet, or since. You progress and eventually find these picture frames. If you touch them or get too close, a face appears and it laughs at you, pops out, and then eventually will fall down past the floor. I was a dumb 14-year-old kid when I first played this, but even this whole section freaked me out. It's been over 10 years, so... You know, this doesn't scare me anymore. More than anything, it just impresses me that, again, a game from 2005 on a portable system that wasn't even a year old at this point was doing this. And then, the boss fight with Drossia herself. Far and away, the best track in the game starts as Drossia makes her appearance. And unlike the other bosses, it's a real boss fight, in the Kirby style, health bar and all. Her first phase, while adding to the atmosphere and is actually really fun to fight, it's not too hard. Once you understand what you have to do, the attacks get a bit faster, but she still goes down. And then... Kirby community loves saying, oh, <laughs> Kirby games, you know, for kids, while showing creepy imagery, and absolutely, every single one of them is correct, but this is my go-to example for the absolute most messed up thing in any Kirby game. Seriously, what am I looking at? I can barely make out her face, which just makes this whole thing even worse. And the music being all disorganized, all sanity from the composition just gone. The fight itself, of course, is an absolute blast, one of the many highlights of the entire game, and very rarely does she actually expose herself, and when she does, you gotta make it count. I wouldn't call this crazy hard, at least once you figured out how to deal efficient damage, but the fact that it's just an absolute joy to play on top of, and you can hold me to this, the best atmosphere and buildup that any Kirby game has ever had makes this one of the highlights of the entire franchise. You beat her, scar any young kid playing the game again for further measure, why not? And game's over. I don't know what else I can add here. The game is just outstanding, simple as that. Everything about the game works on some fundamental level, and even the parts of it that are flawed still have some level of enjoyment to them. Start to finish, there are simply no low points here, and the best parts of this game might make you think that this game should have been number one. But I have it at number 7 for a reason. For all the praise I gave it, I know number 7 sounds pretty low, but the standards for the franchise are just really way too high. Still, play this game. Absolute masterpiece.